as agree It's almost like when we first met Oh, I don't care, it's getting too late I want you and I can't wait Don't wanna spend a minute without you I know you feel the same So come on, give me love I'ma show you how to move, how to move with my body so good girls, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to a brand new video. I am home from Australia, which feels really, really strange as you can see. Got the tiny little Christmas tree up, feels very weird to be home. For those of you who are new to my channel and don't know, I have just spent the past six weeks in Australia, touring the East Coast, and I have had the absolute best time. I really wanna go back and I'll speak about that in a little bit. Today's video is all to do with you guys. You guys sent me in so many questions that you wanna know about Australia, about my adventure project who took us to Australia and just general general cues so we're gonna get straight on into it I'm gonna be completely open and honest in this video there is a few things that like I'm a little bit uncomfortable to hear maybe or to talk about but that's a bit later on in the video well I do just need to say that it's absolutely nothing to do with my adventure project that is just a separate situation that I'll get onto in a sec but if your question isn't answered in this video then definitely leave it down below I have tried to answer every single one if there was a duplicate or like something a little bit similar I have just kind of meshed it all into one Maybe you didn't see my Instagram story, so definitely follow me and for future videos you can get involved. First one I'm just gonna kick start with because it's very, very obvious and I just wanna tell you guys how much of an amazing trip I had. Would you visit Australia again? My answer is absolutely. I am actually going back next year to live there. Very big decision from you has, very ballsy. I have not been happier than when I was in Australia. I have said that before when I visited. I was with different people each time, so it really isn't people depending it is the place. I was also speaking to somebody that we met on one of the boats and they were like, for some reason, if I was to work a job in the UK, just like a random job, I personally wouldn't feel as accomplished. Whereas if I moved to Australia and worked the exact same job, I would feel like on top of the world, I'd feel like I've achieved so much more. And it is weird because I kind of feel the same. Even if I did the same job that I do now over there, I personally would just feel like I've accomplished so much more. I think it's because it's coming out of your comfort zone. Obviously, like even when people move to see and stuff. They feel as though they've accomplished a lot and it is. I mean, moving out from home, moving away, moving away from your friends as well, moving country, anything like that. I mean, it might be so small to somebody else, but absolutely massive to the person doing it. So I am super happy to say that I'll be doing that next year. I won't be doing it to the end of the year, only because I want to pass my driving test before I go, because I am a silly girl and I haven't passed it yet. Definitely stay tuned for that if you want to stick around. Second question is quite an important one. I had quite a few of you message me about this after hearing about what happened at the airport, which I will discuss shortly. Of course, we definitely got insurance. The insurance company that we went with was Tesco Travel. Our insurance in total cost 202 pounds, which may sound super expensive, but we were away for six weeks. Usually you only go like for a week and you pay about seven pounds, but we also added a gadget cover because we had all of our laptops, our cameras, our GoPros, everything with us. And we obviously didn't want to run the risk of losing it and not be able to claim, or like if we damaged it, we just want to, you know, have the reassurance that we have insurance there. I'm going to speak about this in a little while but I'm gonna just talk about insurance because I actually do think it's really really important I know a lot of people do just like kind of click the first one they see but you really do need to look into it because we faced a problem later down the line that we really needed our insurance for but we'll get to that I think this question is probably the most asked which is completely fair enough so I'll be completely transparent with you guys the question is how much would the trip be if it wasn't gifted to you the company that we went with is called my adventure project and what we did was similar to their premium package this would have costed you around 2649 however we did also add things on like we did a skydive we did waterfall in Byron bay and we also did a few extra nights in other places as well so this obviously would have built up more of a cost so you're looking at about three thousand pounds booking with my adventure project for the same itinerary that we did however that is six weeks of the east coast your accommodation sorted your travel sorted your food on the tours sorted personally i think that is absolutely incredible booking with them just takes away the stress of planning. I know a lot of people who we met out there tried to plan ahead but then when they got there maybe hostels were full and they had to go stay somewhere a little bit more expensive that was out of their budget. There was also people who couldn't go on their Fraser Island tour so they were having to travel up the east coast and then coming back on themselves in order to fit the dates of their Fraser Island tour which obviously it's not a bad thing but it's just a bit inconvenient whereas booking it through my adventure project to put everything in order we knew exactly what we were doing we have a straight itinerary and you can actually alter that yourself so oh shit. Shit, I didn't wish my dad a happy birthday. 
Oh my god, I'm such an awful human being. Personally found this saved so much stress. And also on top of that, it means that you don't have to do any extensive research yourself. Believe me, planning to move to Australia or to do an East Coast tour for however many weeks you want to do by yourself, it's quite hard. It's draining. There's so many companies that you need to research into, like to make sure that they're the right company to go with and that you're spending your money right. So booking through my adventure project just gave us the reassurance that we were working with the best companies and we were having the best experience possible. They have so many years of experience of going to Australia themselves so I definitely trust their judgment. On top of that if you are ever worried about anything while you're over there they are literally just a whatsapp away so you will have a whatsapp conversation with them active 24 7 to answer any queries that you have which we did have a group chat with Seb I'm sure we annoyed him quite a fair bit but he was super super helpful while we were there answered all of our queries our requests he's just a very incredible guy bless him. Being travel agents themselves they know like the best places to go so they can also give like a few recommendations. I know that we got some like restaurants recommendations from Seb which was super Super good and just things to do and see at the time as well that are free instead of having to spend so much money like forking out doing crazy stuff you can actually do so much for free there personally i think the experience that they can provide and the knowledge that they have it's just pretty priceless i don't really think you can put a price on that and it is such a weight off your shoulders if you're going into this trip completely blind especially as a solo traveler another amazing thing as well that i've mentioned in a couple of previous videos is they have a facebook page so if you are a solo traveler you can join the this Facebook group. I'll leave it down below in the description. And you can meet loads more solo travelers, meaning you can form friendships before you go and you can probably meet up with them. It's just more reassuring knowing that there's people there literally in the same boat as you, which there is anyway, don't stress about that. But it is nice to like, have a little bit of contact with people who are gonna be there as well. On top of that, our flights were around 2.7K. So the first one was 1,000 pounds and then the second one was 1,700, obviously, because we had to go from Cairns to Melbourne, Melbourne to Doha, and and then Doha to the UK. It was expensive for flights. However, it isn't usually that expensive. When I went a few years ago, I got all of my flights for 1.5K, but I was just staying in Melbourne and Sydney. The reason for that is, was because we went through Qatar. That is obviously where the World Cup was. And we literally had no idea when we booked it like four months ago. So that was a fault on our end for it being expensive like that. So it would definitely be cheaper for you, don't worry. <laughs> Another big question asked was, can you alter the tour? Which absolutely, that is basically the point of my adventure project. You do have a few calls beforehand. If there's something that you really don't want to do, for example, at first I was really against scuba diving because of how scared I was of the ocean. But I'm so glad that I did still take the trip with my friends. I know that in the end I didn't end up doing it. But the snorkeling part of that trip was still really incredible. And if you said to me at the start of the trip that I was going to be doing snorkeling and I was going to be just in the ocean, I would never, ever, ever believe you because I was so scared before. I'm glad that I had that opportunity. Obviously, I didn't do it, but I might do it in the future. A little bit more confident. <laughs> Definitely be open and honest with them. If there's something you want to do, they could probably work something out for you. So it's just like the Fraser Island or Brian's tours. They just put it all together for you and make a personalized plan for you, which is super good. The way that my adventure project work as well was another question that I got. A few of you got like a little bit confused, but if you do visit their website, it's super self-explanatory. You literally just tell them how long you want to spend in Australia, what your choice of travel is, what your favorite tours are that you want to do and the activities that you want to do and they just plan it all for you. Would you ditch the backpack next time? I mean, you could easily do it with a suitcase. We do know a few people who did that. However, there was quite a few hostels, for example, the Arts Factory in Byron Bay, which didn't have lifts or anything, which is very normal in a hostel, especially like in the more rural areas. It's very uncommon to have a lift. Having to carry a suitcase upstairs would be a lot harder. The backpacks were just easier for like mobility wise. Sometimes I was like, oh, I wish I could be dragging a suitcase down this road right now instead of having 20 kilograms on my back. It was quite painful at times, but you got to do what you got to do and what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We were stronger by the end of the trip. I felt just a lot more fitter from doing it. So I personally would take a backpack. It also was good if you saw my pack with me video that I had the separate backpack that zipped onto it. Completely up to you though, but I personally would go for a backpack. Did you exchange your Great British pounds into Australian dollars? Yes, and I highly recommend doing it because the conversion rate that you get charged on top of your card, like for a non-Great Britain transaction fee, it's like pound fifty. which if you're spending money 24-7 there for six weeks, it's like that is a lot. So what I did was I went to the post office and I got a post office card. I've done this before for when I went to LA and stuff. And it's super 
super easy. You get the app, you top it up on your phone, you can see your balance all the time and you don't get charged those extra fees. So definitely recommend. Another one that you could do is Monzo. I heard that was really good. A lot of people we met out there, Jazz and Soph did it. And it also tells you what exactly you're spending your money on. So like if you spent too much money on food, eating out, drinking, anything like that, it tells you all of that. So maybe it will help you budget more. How bad was the jet lag has, to be honest? As soon as we got there, we went out quite a lot. Exploring and like we went out in Sydney, I think twice. It kind of helped, it kept us up. I didn't really find it that bad. We then were so tired from doing so much in the days that you did just fall asleep and naturally fall into a pattern anyway. It did end up that we were going to sleep about 9 p.m., 8 p.m. every single night at one point. However, I have found coming home that my jet lag is a lot worse. I am going to sleep around five. Last night I went to sleep at 10, which was quite good. But then I'm always waking up at 2 a.m. as if I need to start my day and I don't even feel tired. Yesterday morning I got up at 2 a.m., lasted the whole day, and then when it got to about five, I was like, wow, I am dipping so much. So I just like sat on my laptop doing work. I was like, how do you need to get work done and you need to stay awake? So I lasted till about 10. I thought that was, that was quite good. Would you personally spend more time in Sydney? I'm going there next year. Personally, no. I feel like a week was enough only because I have been there before. So all of the touristy things I'd already done. Obviously it was nice to like see the others experience it and I was super happy for them. It was really cute. Watching them be like so excited seeing the Sydney Opera House and stuff. Personally, wouldn't stay there for longer. I've just, just kind of like I've been there there, done that it's a city i live in a city in the uk so it's not really anything different to me don't get me wrong it is amazing i just prefer the more rural areas in your opinion which is best to travel the east coast going up north or down south i love traveling up north because i feel like it just got better and better it was kind of like you just got like teased along the way and then it just was so incredible i honestly can't fault a single part of it though it did just get better and better i can't fault it it was so good also the climate in australia starting in melbourne or sydney or anywhere like that is so much better because as you travel up the east coast the climate gets so much hotter it is unbearable it's humid and i feel like if we jump straight into cairns especially in comparison to the weather here i feel like getting used to the climate going up for six weeks just helped us so much more i feel like if we jumped straight into cairns it would have been diabolical for us would you consider staying in hotels next time i feel like hostels especially if you're a solo traveler is such a good way to meet people that also means you could meet people to like continuously travel with i have met some friends for life. I didn't meet them in the hostels because we were such a big group that we literally filled our room anyway. There were a few times where we had, I think, three people in our room when we had a seven bed dorm, eight bed dorm. But we didn't really like stay in contact. We more so made friends on the tours that we did or like if we were just doing like a day tour. I didn't hate the hostel life. I actually quite liked it. On the topic of making friends, how easy was it to make friends? As a group, I'll be honest, it was quite difficult because I feel as though people see a big group. We were a group of five. That is that's quite big for traveling. It's kind of intimidating. I would personally look at a group of five and I wouldn't want to walk over to their table. I'd be like, I'm gonna leave you guys to it. However, if I saw two people sat by themselves or a solo traveler, I would be more inclined to go over and make conversation, which is no fault of anyone's. I don't blame anyone for that. I also don't blame us because we were like trying our best to make friends, but as a group, it is just quite hard. We did make like a few friendships along the way, but nothing solid. We only really made solid friendships on the tours. For example, Fraser Island, there was like a big group of 20 and we kept in contact with them the whole way. We kept like bumping into them. That was super fun. And then also our Whitsundays boat. So True Blue Sailing. We we definitely made friends for life on that boat. It was just incredible. I mean, you guys know Ross and Harry. They're literally like my babies. I can't wait to go see them next year because they're actually living out there. More so reason for me to go, is it not? I honestly have loved every single person that we have made a good friendship with. Holly as well. She's now in Bali and she's going to be coming back and be seeing her next year. There's just so many. Even the crew were just so friendly, so lovely. With the tours as well, Uncle Brian's Charlie was our tour guide and he was incredible. Kept in contact with him too. Two. And with our Fraser Island tour, our driver, Jeff, was just absolutely incredible, just made the experience. So even though like the tour guides, for example, aren't like friends for life, they were so friendly. And if you're a solo traveler, they really do make an effort with you as well. And it's just so reassuring to know that you're gonna meet so many friends and so many nice people and just come across the most incredible people while you're on your East Coast tour. I mean, that's just Australia for you. Where was your favorite place to stay? Either Early Beach or Byron Bay. I feel like everyone was just super friendly just anyone that even worked in hospitality and stuff was just so nice there and there was just so much to do like even just chilling on the beach all day it's a beautiful beach there's so many walks to do surfing lessons and stuff obviously if you then take up surfing incredible place to go surfing those two places as well really got me out of my comfort zone with the dolphin kayaking and the jet skiing I never would have done jet skiing before if it wasn't for that even the boats I've never done snorkeling before in my life because I thought I was too scared to the Atlantic Clipper I did it then and it was 
incredible. I feel like they hold a special place in my heart for that reason. Cairns is also a very close third. The only thing that puts me off is it's quite drug fueled. I'll be honest. Like there is some places that I wouldn't want to walk at night by myself. However, I wouldn't do that anyway. Like I wouldn't walk anywhere in Cairns by myself at night just because I am such a paranoid young girl, to be honest. It's not as though anything would happen to you. It's just like, there's some scary things to be seen. And I'm going to be honest about that. Like I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There was quite a lot of drugged up people there that will just talk to you, but not in a very nice way. And you do just kind of have to like block that out a little bit. Just don't go walking around by yourself in Cairns. Would you do a solo trip? As I said at the beginning, I am going to be going next year, but I will be going by myself. I do think everyone else that came with me want to go back out there, but like I'm moving, so. What was the reality of staying in a hostel and which ones would you not stay in again? I obviously don't mean any disrespect to the companies and I'm not being ungrateful in saying this either because I do have to address, like I am so lucky to have gone there and been able to have a roof over my head, a place to stay. I would stay there again. It's it's not like I'm completely writing it off. However, I am gonna say straight off the bat that the Brisbane Nomads, it was insanely beautiful Brisbane. I can't fault Brisbane at all. Like I definitely will be revisiting Brisbane as a city, especially down by the river, it's so, so gorgeous. However, the nomads was quite run down, which fair enough. I mean, the effects of COVID really, really hit everything in Australia, like every single business possible. The only thing that made it unpleasant was the people staying there. The toilets and the kitchen and the living spaces were just disgusting. Like there was raw chicken out on the side, like cross contamination of everything. There was just food left everywhere, plates left in the sink that people haven't cleaned up after themselves. And I just think, why would you do that in a hostel when at home you would clean up after yourself? Like don't disrespect somebody else's space just because it's not yours. That was the only thing about the Brisbane Nomads. I would stay there again. I mean, it wasn't bad at all. The staff was super friendly. I actually bumped into a childhood friend that worked there, which was really, really crazy. It was just the people that made it unpleasant. We have also heard multiple stories about other people saying that about the Brisbane Nomads. Like it... Hello? Oh, I'll hear it then, that's fine. Goody. All right then, bye. We have also heard other people say that Brisbane Nomads was not their favorite. And I mean, I know it sounds really horrible to say because as I said, it is still a place to stay. It's incredible that we even managed to find a place to stay. I feel like you can be honest with yourself. If I could tell you to avoid somewhere so you could stay somewhere better, possibly even for cheaper, I don't know, then I would, I would rather tell you that. That does not go for all nomads though. I mean, we have stayed in some incredible nomads, especially the Sydney one. Beds were amazing. Like that was a really, really cool place. Obviously had the bar next door. What's it called? Scary Canary. The Brisbane hostel had a club connected downstairs and they did offer a lot of like free food, free drinks and stuff. So I can't fault them for that. It was just the people that made them unpleasant. I also do need to address that there is of course a cost of living crisis in Australia, just like there is in the UK. Hostels are full. A lot of people that we spoke to about there couldn't even get a place. Like they were scared of being homeless for that night while they were traveling. And what they had to do in the end was pay like an extortionate amount for their hostels. I think somebody paid like two grand for two weeks in nomads, which is quite expensive. And that was their last resort because otherwise they were gonna be homeless and like everywhere else was the same price. Definitely booking with my adventure project is such a big help. You know that you have your accommodation sorted in advance. The next one I'm gonna talk about is Gilligan's, which I'm absolutely disgusted by, I'm not gonna lie. Once I tell you about it, I feel like you'll feel the same. Please take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. Obviously that was my experience. Everyone else there seemed to have an amazing time. So it's just a personal preference. Could not fault the hostel at all. The actual hostel hostel was amazing the rooms were amazing they had a balcony like that is unheard of in hostel realm like that was so cool and it had a really great club downstairs a big pool it was just the staff the bouncers mainly i am the type of person that if i see something on a night out i literally get terrified and i will never want to go to that place ever again and i definitely experienced that on one of the last nights in gilligan there have been rumors gone around before there is like a few reviews on it as well which we didn't check out sadly i kind of wish we did about how the bouncers really abuse their power and how they can just be quite nasty sometimes and reasonably. We also found that with the staff that work there anyway, using their power because they can, like they're bored and they just, you know, want to make your life a bit more difficult. It was kind of like that. We were sat there one night in the club downstairs at Gilligan's. We were all just sat chatting. We saw these six bouncers. I obviously don't know what this guy has done. He could have done something extremely wrong. I just don't think this is warranted in any kind of situation. They pinned his arms behind his back. Fair enough. That's obviously restraining someone. But then they got his head and smashed it on the floor and I literally watched them do it. Like they they grabbed his hair and smashed his face on the floor and that was just traumatizing let alone f like for him that was terrifying and i can't even explain how sick i felt but then i went to go over like all of us were like what the 
shock and like we went to go over being like you can't do that to people you what is he even done just in shock and just saying whatever came out my mouth i was like oh my god you can't do that when he lifted his head up he had like a smashed nose his face was so I'm not gonna lie. And a girl walked past us and she was like, do not get involved because you will be next. Like, do not get involved. They do not care what gender you are. They will beat you up. And we were like, surely not. So in the more people we spoke to, apparently Gilligan's is known for the bouncers taking you down alleyways and beating you up if you get kicked out. That was really scary to hear. I don't like people abusing their power and I just think it's disgusting. I am gonna blast them online about it. I just thought that was gross. I thought the staff was gross. Minus a few, there was a few nice girls at the front desk. Personally, if you're gonna stay there, just be super careful. Please do not get too drunk and like do anything out of the ordinary. Don't piss off the bouncers. They also wouldn't let us say goodbye to our friends, which was just, it was just mean. Our friends were inside and they like came to this little opening where a security guard was stood and we walked over to them and we was like, oh, excuse me, like, is it okay if we just hug our friends goodbye because we're flying home tomorrow? And he was like, absolutely not like put his arm in front of our friend like pushed it back a little bit and was like no either they queue again and repay entry really like it's like 20 quid entry we were like please like is there any chance and we were like being really nice like please and he was absolutely not having it fair enough that is probably their policy but if i was a security guard i would just let it happen so that wasn't like the worst. The beating up situation was definitely the worst. Absolutely diabolical. Is there anything you wish that you didn't do? I would probably give Sydney a miss. I didn't really like the going out scene so much. Um, again, it's a city. I live in a city at home, so prefer the rural areas. It was also quite expensive too. The cities always are. But I do understand that a lot of people settle there. There is a lot of big jobs to be had. There's a lot of sponsorships to be had. So I do understand why people go there. And it's super populated. Maybe that is more your vibe, but I personally wouldn't go there again. Surface Paradise, I also wouldn't do. It was just more of a waste of our time and money. It was a waste of our time and money because there wasn't really much to do there. So if I was to go back, I personally would skip over Service Paradise. Other people might like it. I know there was a festival on the week before we went and we met so many people that were like, oh my God, Surface was sick. The hostel, however, buds loved it that was a really good hostel beautiful pool as well really friendly staff a lot to do there doing the hostel there was like ping pong and stuff and the kitchen was really really clean so i liked that is there anything that you wouldn't have taken so if you have watched my pat with me i took a tupperware and like a reusable cutlery set what we found was as soon as we went to cook everything was there they had all the utensils plates knives forks spoons and people just washed them up and put them back a lot of the clothes as well i didn't need as many trousers as i took because it was boiling we literally lived in bikinis and shorts i genuinely gave not half my clothes probably like quarter of my clothes away when we went to arts factory on our last day we were also doing a collab with kulakinis and we said to the girls at arts factory like is there any that you want because like there were there was just so many they were super generous and it was just incredible so we basically just said guys these are our clothes like is there anything you want to put it on the table and it was actually really nice to just like sit and watch them like pass around and try on and stuff but then i accumulated more clothes as we went along like in the vintage stores, thrift shopping and stuff. Personally, I'd take less clothes than what I did. Looking at it before I went, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna need more clothes. And on the first week I did say that, but that was in Sydney. When we got to Byron Bay and further on, I was like, get these clothes out my bag. I literally was living the exact same thing every single day. So less is more. And it's also made me realize I can be a bit more minimalistic now that I'm home. I mean, I opened my wardrobe and I was like, there's so much in here, like so much I can wear. And it's kind of weird putting outfits together now. Like I'm just, I'm just comfortable wearing the same thing, which isn't a bad thing. Which activities do you suggest the most? Skydiving, top of my list, absolutely. Definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity. I personally would suggest doing it further up the coast. So we missed Mission Beach, but apparently that is beautiful. You can travel two hours, I believe, down from Ken on obviously the Greyhound, or you can find out some other form of transport. That's what our friend Holly did, and she did it there. You do it over the Great Barrier Reef, and that is incredible. So we did ours in Byron Bay. So if that's more of your scene, it was still a beautiful beach and everything. Definitely, definitely do it. It was just the most incredible experience and I'm definitely gonna do it again. I know I said once in a lifetime, but like a lot of people will do it and be like, yep, yeah, that's it. That was amazing, but I don't think I could do it again. But apparently the second time is actually better because you know what to expect. So you can just take in your surroundings more. Obviously, as I said, Uncle Brian's, Fraser Island, Whitsundays with True Blue Sailing, the scenic flight as well that we did was also incredible. Also jet skiing was really good in early beach i kind of wish we had a bit longer because we did have like a bit of a fault with our jet ski and i feel like once we got back into the swing of it our lesson was then over so maybe do like a three hour tour if you can and go all the way out when we were doing our scenic flight we saw people jet skiing around the
around the Whitsundays and that just looked phenomenal. There's also a lot of free stuff to do. We really enjoyed the lighthouse walk when we got there. So many beautiful butterflies. The views were insane. The forts walk in Cairns as well was super educational. You could see the koalas up close. That was so nice. Magnetic Island, Jeffrey Bay, where you can feed the wallabies. That was also super cute. Highly, highly, highly recommend the three day tours that we did. So the companies that we did them with was Dingo's on Fraser Island. Uncle Brian's was the Cape Tribulation tours. Super incredible. How much money roughly did you spend every day? So I'm going to be super open and honest about this. If this is something you're like a bit uncomfortable with, then definitely skip ahead. But I feel like I have to be in order for you to plan properly. I won't lie. We definitely did lead a bit more of a lavish lifestyle than we expected. We ate out a lot more than we anticipated and we thought we were going to cook a lot more. But it was more convenience. I'm not going to lie. A lot of the times we'd come back from a jam-packed day of doing stuff and we'd be like, right, let's go to Coles and get some food. Coles was shut. So then we would have to eat out somewhere because, well, we haven't got any food to cook. I suggest the first day that you get somewhere, head straight to the store and get stuff. It is a bit difficult if you're doing like a three day tour or something though, because you don't want to leave your food there for too long. You also don't want to leave it there and someone take it. We had that quite a few times, especially in Byron Bay. Especially when we were in early, like we just ended up at McDonald's all the time because everything just shut quite early. We were there on a weekend and weirdly everything closed earlier on a weekend. It closed at like 4 p.m., which we found so strange. So we did end up eating out more than we would have liked. And that is such a privilege for us to be able to do. Like, I'm not going to lie about that. A lot of people do budget themselves so that they can eat out there, which is completely fair enough. I wish we did the same because I'm not happy about the amount of money I spend. That was just what what we did. Some days were more expensive as well. So like we added things on such as like the footage for the skydive. That was 150. Don't quote me. Don't know if it was pounds or dollars. That was an add on. So that made a few days more expensive. So overall, I'd say that I aimed for $40 a day. What was that like 23 pounds, 25 pounds. But realistically, I spent $2,873 minus the $70 that are still left on my card. That is 2.8K. Change that into English pounds. That's 1,536 pounds. And we went for 42 days. So dividing that all up, that's 36 pounds. I personally don't think that is that bad considering it could be a lot worse. I had a lot of questions about my GoPro. So the GoPro that I used was the Hero 10. Highly recommend for all of your underwater stuff. And I also preferred everything I filmed on my GoPro, to be honest. There was a lot of stuff that I was like filming on my actual camera. And I just preferred the stabilization. The stabilization was so much better compared to my Sony camera. I love filming on my camera at home because it's stable and it's in one place. But for vlogging, stabilization has really thrown me off recently, guys, I'll be honest. Really tempted to go back to the Canon G7X. But let me know if you have any suggestions for vlog cameras. That would be great. How much swimwear would you recommend taking? I have a whole video in this. If you do want to go watch it, I'll link it below. But I'd probably say like six. Try and get mix and match ones though. Like maybe you could get a white and a black one and you can mesh that together or two different types of blues or just something like that because everyone wears the same stuff all the time don't worry about being a fashionista over there everyone just dresses for comfort so it's completely fine what happened on your journey home so i want you to keep an open mind about this and put yourself into how we would have been feeling because i feel like the way i'm going to say it everyone will be like oh well you could have just added a few more hours like you should have planned ahead fair enough but let me explain when we got to Cairns airport we went to board our flight to melbourne we we're flying with jetstar we made it so that when we got to Melbourne airport, we would have three and a half hours, which I think is a reasonable amount of time. They tell you to do four hours for international flights anyway. So we thought that was fairly good. We we're already in the airport. We don't need to get there and stuff like that. All we'd need to do when we got to the airport was get our bags, take them, check in, sort it. When we got to Cairns airport, they were delayed by two hours 50. The reason that we were delayed actually was because there was a problem with the plane and the cargo. They said we could have flown with it, but they wanted to put like something temporary in anyway. Obviously I'm thankful that they fixed the plane. It was really really a Phoebe and Rachel moment from friends, like where's the left phalange kind of thing. We then set off and that delayed our time obviously. And as we went to land, we realized that our other plane was taking off. So the problem that we had was when we booked our flights, we had to book our Cairns flight separately because there wasn't one that we could do with the connecting flights unless we wanted it to take like 52 hours, which obviously that is not ideal. So we decided to go with a separate company and book Jetstar and the rest of our trip would be with Qatar Airways. The rest of the trip was a connecting flight though. So I will just say that. In the past before, I have been straight away from booking with like travel companies. For example, when I went to Benicassim, there was a problem with our flight and the travel agency were like, ah, it's not actually our fault, it's the airlines. And then the airlines was like, nope, not our fault. It's the travel agents and our insurance wouldn't really do anything about it because no one would take blame. Similar situation, I kind of suggested to everyone like, let's not book it for a company because I've been 
over with that before. But that also then got us over because it wasn't a connecting flight. We did end up missing our flight from Melbourne to Doha. That is because obviously our flight was delayed. And when we got to the airport, we were like, is there anything we can do? Like when is the next flight? Can we buy a new ticket? As we got to the desk, so we went to Jetstar first and they were like, there's not much we can do, it's not our fault. And we said, okay, fair enough because it isn't a connecting flight, but is there anything that you can do compensation wise? Because usually if your flight is three hours delayed for any reason, it's an inconvenience to you and you usually get like money back. I think the flight was only like 90 pounds. So we weren't like too bothered about getting that back, but a little bit of something would have been nice, obviously, because we have just missed our flight now. Jetstar then sent us to Qatar Airways and we met this lovely woman. She was so helpful. She literally tried everything she could. Um, oh. Hell. She was the loveliest woman ever and she really did try to help us out, bless her. But obviously I know it is policies and this is where like it got a little bit confusing. We obviously didn't expect a near three hour delay. You don't expect that. We then had to call up Qatar and buy tickets because I didn't know you couldn't buy tickets at an airport, guys. I don't know why, I just I just thought you could. Uh, so we had to call up Qatar. We were back and forth with them, must have called about nine times. They answered the phone and they were like, oh yeah, you have to pay 500 dollar fee for missing the flight which was such a stab to the heart because we really felt as though like that wasn't our fault and i know that might come across like quite entitled but i personally don't think it is i feel like if you were in that position and you got told that you have to pay for a flight that wasn't your fault that you missed i'm pretty pissed off <laughs> also can i just say when we were on the jetstar flight and we knew we were going to miss our flight because we were so delayed we did try and call qatar airways to like let them know to maybe hold the plane because we weren't going to be too far off missing it and it did actually end up leaving 20 minutes later than usual so if they knew in advance they possibly could have waited i have known them in the past to wait for passengers so that is what we thought the outcome would be the woman on the end of the phone she wasn't very helpful at the time we tried to get the information to them but it just didn't really work out we bought our tickets which luckily we didn't have to pay flow right for new tickets we could just pay the difference for the next flight but obviously because it was the world cup it was still quite expensive when we finally thought oh my god thank god we're going home I don't want to be in this airport any longer. We went to check in and Anna's passport had like not flagged up. It basically said that she was on the flight that we missed, which is super dangerous because if that flight crashed, then emergency services are going to try and find her, risking their lives when she's not actually on the plane. I don't know whose fault that was. Definitely wasn't ours because we hadn't even managed to check in. So, but it did mean that there was complications then with getting her ticket. We then had to call up Qatar Airways again. And by this point, the women behind the desk were also like, we were just kind of having a bit of a laugh with each other because we were like, how has this even happened? Like, this is just ridiculous. And they were literally saying the same. They were like, it's, it's honestly laughable because how how has this happened? The girls that helped us out were honestly super lovely and we wouldn't have made the flight without them. So in the end, they canceled Anna's ticket and we were like, is Anna gonna be left here? We're all just gonna stay with her. Like we literally didn't even care about the money at that point. We were like, we're not leaving our friend on the other side of the world to fly home by herself, especially when like we were all kind of in like an emotional state right now. They managed to sort it out. I'm not even joking you about 20 minutes before the gate closed and we were like running for it. We went through the security and everything and we were bolting it. It doesn't even stop there though. When we went to board, everyone had got on the plane and me and Byron were in zone three. So we were like the last people to get on and we handed our passports and it beeped and we were like, why? I and mean, then we were, we were thinking we're not even gonna be able to get on this plane and we've just paid all this money to like get on the next one and then we're gonna have to pay even more money to get on the next one. Oh my God, it was just honestly such a faff. I would love to say that looking back, I can laugh at it, but I don't think I can yet because it's still money that shouldn't have been spent and it's hurtful. <laughs> it's, it's hard when like stuff happens like that and you do have to fork out money that you weren't expecting to because I was, I was quite reasonably happy with like funds for Australia and then that happened and I was just like, okay. But at least we know in future to plan more ahead. Personally, don't want to spend six hours in an airport if the flight was to leave on time, but if it saves me from missing a flight in the future and having to pay all that money again, we'd definitely do that. The last two questions are revolving around transport. So obviously just want to give a shout out to Greyhound because I mean, they got us around everywhere without them. I don't even know what would happen. They were incredible. They also work closely with my venture project. You guys asked how close were your hostels to your transport for the next day? Literally 10 to 15 minutes. Every single place we got to we'd be like oh we've got a trek with our bags like how long have we got to walk really not far 10 to 15 minutes sometimes at the start of the trip it was a bit strenuous like i think surface paradise is probably the worst no byron bay was the worst was it 
I think Byron Bay was the worst. Maybe that was the longest one. But then by the time that we reached the end of our Byron Bay, we were like, the bus stop is literally there. It's not far at all. It just felt like long because we didn't really know where we were going. The last one is, would you choose to fly instead of an overnight bus? It is tempting. However, you can get a Greyhound 60 day Wimit pass, which is very, very beneficial for $499. You don't have to worry about this if you do book through an app like My Adventure Project because they sort it out all for you. I am unaware if they do longer, but I just know that the 60 day is what we got. 273 pounds that would be for 60 days of travel and you can go wherever you want as many times as you want. I think that's pretty good. I will admit the 16 hour coach though was a bit of a killer. That was only because of my own personal sickness though. Like the actual coach was completely fine. Afterwards I actually discovered quells. I'm a bit annoyed I didn't know about them before. I thought it was just an American thing. I didn't know you could actually get them there but as soon as I got there I was like straight I think it was Rainbow Beach and I got straight into the pharmacy and I was like please don't if you got anything with travel sickness, I've just thrown my guts up for 16 hours. Definitely get some quails if you're travel sick. So, Groovy Girls, that is it for today's video. And I really, really hope this has helped some of you answer some of your questions or queries that you had. Remember, if you do have any more, definitely leave them down below. I will be answering all of you. Also, give me a follow on Instagram because if you want a like, more in-depth combo, then just DM me and we can talk about anything to do with Australia, backpacking, traveling next year. I don't know, if you're having just a down day and you want to message me, then you can definitely do that too. I love you so, so much. Thank you so, so much to my adventure project for just the most incredible trip. You guys, you fucking killed it. And I just owe you my life. I owe everything to you. I love you so, so much. And I would really encourage you all to check them out. So many of our friends are also going to Australia, so you can check out their trips as well. Love Evie, Olivia Grace Herring, Megan Shaw, Eve Bennett. There's some more that I can't say right now, but so many of our friends are going and you can also see just how much of an incredible experience they had. Definitely check out the gang's videos from when we went. So you have Byron, Jazz, Soph and Anna. I'll leave all of their links in the description. Not that you need that. But it's just nice to see like a different perspective sometimes. I love you all so, so much and I will see you in the next video. Girls. Nothing quite like this. I get a high